Welcome aboard, everyone. I'm really excited to have this group of people around the table here, and also about 100 or so people online from City of Victoria, various school boards across the province, city of around around Ottawa, a number of cities, federal provincial government. So uh, a lot of interest in quite a techie issue. And this is such an important issue. Uh, we often don't think of the important role that uh, buses play when you think about overall greenhouse gas emissions, but it really is quite significant. We're with two pioneering transit authorities today that are really uh, uh, charting a course that can influence what we can do with all of our bus stock uh, in British Columbia, in Canada, and across the United States. And it's really, really quite significant what we can learn from what's going on here. Uh, we're going to take four stops on our route today. The first stop is me providing a little, a little bit of context. My name is Alex Boston. I'm the Executive Director at Renewable Cities. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge that we're on the unceded territory of the Musqueam, the Tsleil-Waututh, and uh, the Squamish First Nation, who have for thousands of years um, been moving around this region based on 100% renewables. And we're going to be charting a course back to where they came from. And then our first stop is we're going to land right here in um, Greater Vancouver, and we're going to get some insight into where TransLink is charting the future for transit in this region. And then we're going to go a little bit down the coast to Seattle, to King County Transit Authority, and see what they're doing. And there's so much to learn when we start looking under the hood at the different approaches. And this is a rich learning experience. Over the last hour, um, uh, Sarah and Danny sharing insights and different strategies. And there's a lot to learn as we, we move forward on this agenda. To give you some appreciation of how important this is, um, if we take a look at greenhouse gas emissions in Canada from 1990, um, what we see is incredible uh, growth um, in two sectors more than anything else, oil and gas and road-based transportation. Road-based road -based transportation has grown by 77% in Canada since the early 1990s, faster than the oil and gas sector. And there's a whole bunch of reasons for that. A lot of that is freight, but the, there's been significant growth in personal transportation uh, because of heavier vehicles. Um, also because of a massive growth in vehicle kilometers traveled. Um, and there hasn't been that dramatic mode shifting onto transit despite heavy investments in transit. And that's something that we have to change because in British Columbia, just like in, um, in, in, in the rest of Canada, we've seen modest progress. In fact, progress has been uh, more impressive in the United States under their current administration in reducing greenhouse gas emissions than it has been in Canada. And road-based transportation is an issue that we really have to resolve. And uh, there's really four, four pillars. Uh, one of them is renewable fuels. Another one is efficient vehicle stock. And that's what we're gonna have most of the conversation on today. The others, which we will revisit at some point in the future, are reducing travel demand, vehicle managing vehicle kilometers traveled, and shifting modes. And that's largely around good land use and uh, transportation planning. To give you a sense of um, the BC bus fleet, TransLink has a fleet of about 1,500, about the same size, interestingly, as Seattle, uh, as, as King County Transit. Those are quite large fleets by North American standards. Um, in BC, we actually have about 10,000 buses, more, um, uh, more buses uh, operated by school boards, not as many VKT, or there's not as many kilometers traveled. And then um, the tour bus sector, um, which is tour bus, commercial bus sector, which is, which is very, very diverse. It's only about five, um, half, half a megaton. But to put it into perspective, we have to make a 26 and a half megaton uh, reduction by 2030. We can almost eliminate that by 2040 if we do the right things in British Columbia. Canada, we have 90,000 buses, three and a half megatons. We have to figure out what to do to reduce 44 meg megatons in Canada to, to close an emission gap to meet our Paris commitments. In the US, there's 900,000 buses, um, 37 megatons, 
Uh, targets are a little bit up in the air in the United States, but we are paving the way right here with, um, with, with TransLink and King County Transit Authority in understanding what we can do, not just with transit fleets, but much more broadly. And it's gonna be a very different path for school boards. So the first person, second stop uh, here in Greater Vancouver is gonna be Sarah Buckle. Um, she is the uh, Director of Enterprise and Risk Management, and she's really managing the 100% RE transit agenda here for, for TransLink, and not only involves in Greater Vancouver, but also uh, working nationally on a number of different um, projects to help better understand how to navigate um, uh, this, this path forward and share learning right across this country because there's big things that we can learn from one another. So Sarah. Great, thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, as Alex mentioned, I'm the Director of Enterprise Risk and Sustainability at TransLink. Uh, my team's leading the low carbon fleet strategy, um, the renewable energy target uh, commitment, as well as an electric bus pilot project. So you should see electric buses en route um, in the region starting in early 2019. So, so we're leading that initiative as well. To provide some context about TransLink, um, for those of you who aren't aware, we're a, a multimodal system. Um, so we finance, we plan, and we operate the public transit system within Metro Vancouver. Um, in Metro Vancouver, we service more than 1,800 square kilometers, uh, 21 municipalities in 23 uh, electoral areas, and that's 2.5 million residents. Um, so in addition to our SkyTrain and Canada Line, our bus fleet, our sea bus, we also um, operate the West Coast Express commuter rail. We've got our Handy Dart Access Transit fleet. Uh, we have community shuttles and we've got a dedicated police force. Um, so when we talk about 100% renewable energy, we're not just looking at our buses and, uh, and not even just our fleet, but it also uh, includes our facilities. Um, in October, we saw the highest ridership that we've ever seen at TransLink, which is pretty significant. So we had 39.65 million boardings in that month alone. So we're one of few transit agencies where we're seeing an increase in ridership, and, and we're really proud of that. In October, our board approved in the Mayor's Council uh, that, that governs TransLink approved two significant environmental sustainability targets. The first one being the 80% reduction of greenhouse gas emissions by 2050, and the second one being utilizing 100% renewable energy in all of our operations by 2050. As I mentioned, this isn't just our bus fleet, this includes all of our fleet, as well as our facilities. And I'll speak about our fleet first, um, but I will touch on our facilities because it is part of that, that target. I should also mention too that our facilities uh, make up only about 8% of our total greenhouse gas emissions for our, our full portfolio. Um, so the primary GHG emissions comes from our fleet. To provide some context, the majority of fuel used in our fleet is diesel. We have 26% um, of our fuel consumption being renewable from electricity. We've got about 10% from compressed natural gas and the remaining gasoline. So the gasoline is used in our um, non-revenue fleet, which includes our transit police vehicles, our maintenance vans and our pool cars, um, as well as our newer handy dart uh, vehicles, as well as our community shuttles. Um, we have 262 electric trolleys that operate in the Metro Vancouver area. Um, so that that's used, those uses, uh, use electricity as well as our uh, SkyTrain and Canada line. So that gives a profile of our fleet consumption. Not surprisingly, um, the majority of our greenhouse gas emissions comes from our buses. We've spent the past year or so developing a low carbon fleet strategy, specifically looking at our bus fleet um, because of the, the um, percentage of GHGs from that fleet. Um, over the past year, we've looked at uh, how to transition our bus fleet to meet the 80% reduction of greenhouse gas emissions by 2050, and at the same time meeting our service level and funding requirements, which is, which is just as important. And I'll just touch on some key components of our low carbon fleet strategy. 
This slide here shows um, our greenhouse gas emissions. It's our life cycle greenhouse gas emissions. So both the upstream fuel production, transportation, as well as what comes out of the tailpipes. And you'll see here that our current uh, mix is a, is a mix of diesel, hybrids, compressed natural gas, and our trolley fleet. And our fleet average, you can see this bar um, right here, is about uh, 1,700 grams um, of CO2 emissions per kilometer. We're looking at the use of renewable fuels. So what does that look like? At the bottom, you'll see HDRD, which is the hydrogenated uh, diesel and renewable natural gas. So when we consider using renewable fuels in our fleet, you can see that we uh, achieve quite a significant greenhouse gas reduction. To provide some context, uh, renewable diesel is used um, from a waste feedstock or vegetable oil source, and it's processed the same way as diesel. So it's considered a drop in fuel. So if the supply was available, we could use renewable diesel for all of our diesel fleet as of tomorrow. Renewable natural gas is gas captured from um, landfills and wastewater treatment plants, which is proce processed to pipeline quality. And we're in conversation right now with Fortis BC about procuring natural gas, renewable natural gas, for our compressed natural gas fleet, um, which is a pre pretty significant greenhouse gas reduction. What this slide also shows is that really to meet that 80% reduction of greenhouse gas emissions by 2050, we have to electrify a significant portion of our fleet. And there's three options for electrification. One is using battery electric buses. The second is expanding our trolley network. And the third is using hydrogen fuel cell buses. And we've analyzed all three um, uh, sources in our strategy. The most cost-effective um, electrification scenario for TransLink is battery electric buses for, for our fleet. Um, what we've done here, and there's a lot of uh, inputs to this, to this slide, but we've analyzed the total life cycle costs of both our baseline, electrification scenario one, which includes transitioning all of our diesel buses, our CNG buses, as well as our hybrid to electric, battery electric buses. This electrification scenario one includes converting our trolley buses to trolley buses. And that's really important. Our trolley fleet is up for replacement in the 2026, 2029 timeframe. And it's a, it's a significant uh, consideration for TransLink. Um, electrification scenario two is the same, except we're looking at replacing our trolley buses with battery electric buses. Um, so what it's showing is over the next three or 30 years, electrification, electrification is projected to be less than, than our current baseline. Um, our analysis shows that about about the 2023 timeline, we expect electric buses to be on par with diesel buses, and that's the time frame that we're planning on, on making that transition to battery electric buses. This slide here um, demonstrates scenario two. So this is replacing our battery electric buses uh, or replacing our current fleet with battery electric buses as well as our trolley fleet with battery electric buses. We've done a similar analysis, um, but, but I, I'm just showing you this one. What this slide shows is that there's a significant capital um, Re uh, requirement um, to transition our current fleet to battery electric buses. If you can think about the charging infrastructure required to support a full battery electric fleet, it is very significant. Um, so what we're looking at is a spend of about $260 million in capital funds um, to make that transition. If we considered electrification scenario one, where we replace trolley with trolley, that's in about the $750 million range, um, just due to the, the cost of the trolley buses themselves. The good news is that we see that payback and we see that payback with our operating um, funds. The net savings is expected to be about $1.3 billion over that 30 years, um, bringing us out to 2050. And that's about $24 million per year in, in net savings. Um, so while there's that, uh, that upfront capital um, requirement, we, we do say that savings. And the break-even point in this scenario is about the 2029 timeframe. Some key challenges, of course, um, are related to the, the um, capital requirements, but it's also about the charging infrastructure. There's two types of charging infrastructure for battery electric buses, um, one being charging at the depot. Um, so that's when the buses would come back at the end of the day. They would charge for about six hours um, and then leave the next day with a full battery. 
in this scenario, the buses require a larger battery, which um, tend to be more expensive, uh, but it gives us the flexibility because the charging infrastructure would be behind our fence. Um, the charging infrastructure could be ground mounted between the rows of buses, or it could be on an overhead gantry to charge the buses from, from the top on the rails. The other option is on route charging, um, and that would be um, charging uh, equipment or um, stations located throughout the region. So our analysis um, identified most likely about 150 locations for chargers that we would need throughout the region if we fully went with um, on route charging. Most likely it will be a scenario of both. Um, but with that, uh, buses would be encounter a charger every hour or so, charge for four to five minutes, and then carry on throughout the day. Um, the buses themselves have a smaller battery, so the buses are, are less expensive, um, but the charging infrastructure is more expensive. Plus, we have to consider um, where we're going to find the real estate throughout the re region to install those charging um, stations. And then, of course, we've got our other fleet um, that we need to consider. So in addition to the, our buses, we've got our highway coaches. Um, we did include those in our analysis, and they currently, the range is, is um, too long for current technology to um, electrify that fleet. Um, so we're looking at renewable diesel or um, potentially hydrogen fuel cell for the highway coaches. We've got our sea bus vessels. We're hoping to go out with a feasibility study for an electric sea bus um, in the not too distant future. Our West Coast Express commuter rail, which I can only imagine we would run off renewable diesel. I don't imagine that we will convert our, our rail to electric. And then we've got our community shuttles, um, handy dart vehicles, and our non-revenue fleet, as I mentioned. So a lot to consider um, as part of this target. As I mentioned, I wanted to touch on our facilities um, just quickly. About 60% of our energy used in our facilities is electric, um, which is, which is um, and then the 40% is natural gas. So to achieve that 100% um, renewable energy target, we're gonna have to look at how we can uh, convert some of our natural gas to electricity or um, how, we, um, how we start using renewable natural gas um, where we can't convert. Um, primarily our natural gas and most of our energy um, used in our facilities is from our um, Coast Mountain bus um, operations and the majority of our natural gas is used at our transit centers for um, water heating and uh, makeup air units. We're looking at developing a facility energy management plan and we'll be going out for um, an RFP early next year for assistance with this work. And really that's to ad identify energy efficiency um, opportunities at our own facilities. We've done a lot of work in terms of energy studies and retro commissioning studies at a lot of our facilities, but there's still a lot of work that we need to do. Um, we've made uh, a commitment to our board to bring back in Q3 2019 targets for uh, interim targets for 2030 and 2040 for both commitments, for both our greenhouse gas commitment as well as our renewable energy. So we not need a lot of work um, done before that time frame. Um, also supporting those, uh, going back to the board, we're, we've committed to having a financial plan associated with both targets. So, so there is a lot of work to do. Um, we are continuing with phase two of our low carbon fleet strategy. So that work is going to give us a detailed roadmap for electrification. So that will identify um, which charging scenario we want to move forward with, where the chargers would be located, um, give us a, a fleet procurement um, timeline, as well as identification of when we have to start looking at uh, breaking ground for our charging stations. Um, in addition, we'll be doing uh, working on our facility energy management plan and starting to procure um, renewable fuels for our bus fleet when it's cost effective and when they're available. So I'll pass it on now to Danny. What a great journey around Metro Vancouver. And it's fascinating that we now get to go down to Seattle because the utility context, um, some of the real estate challenges, um, the relationships with local governments, uh, everything changes. And Danny Ilioyu, who's now managing the, the transition to 100% renewable fleet by 2040 in uh, 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 greater Seattle, not only has experience in Seattle, but also prior to this, he was performing a similar role in the city of New York. And it, what we know from the leadership uh, transit authorities and local governments from across North America and Europe, in, in, in fact, is that the, the location 
changes the dynamics fundamentally. Climate changes um, what you're going to be doing. Uh, the leadership work of, of Montreal, it's probably one of the, the leading jurisdictions in, in North America, is very different from what's going to happen here in, in Greater Vancouver and somewhat uh, and very different also from, from Seattle. So Danny has insights and uh, uh, more than one area that he's actually bringing to uh, Greater Seattle and that um, by, by, by virtue of him being there, um, uh, we're, we're able to learn for in, from what we can do um, in Seattle here in, in Greater Vancouver. So I'd like to pass it to Danny Ilioyu. Um, he is the second stop on this journey. And then our third stop will be an open Q&A for everyone around the table. And for those of you that are online, hashtag RECities if you have any questions. Thank you. Thanks, Danny. Thank you. Thank you, Vancouver, for having me. And I'd like to spend the next couple of minutes uh, sharing with you our experience and our journey and our strategy at uh, King County Metro. Uh, we operate a fleet of approximately 1,500 buses in the greater King County area, uh, 39 municipalities, including Seattle. And um, let's dive into it a little bit. So generally, when you look at electri electrifying a fleet, you have three basic options and you can pick one of them or you can do them all three in sequence. Currently at King County Metro, we're in the second option where we're in the uh, midst of uh, testing and evaluating. We have 11 battery electric buses in two slightly different configurations. We're about to start another test with 10 additional buses. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes. What's very interesting with electric buses is, and it's not really apparent, is that electric buses bring a benefit not just to the riders, but also to the residents that live along the route. They're quieter, they're smoother, and the fact that there's zero emissions means that the benefit is pretty widespread. The largest challenge in converting our fleet is uh, due partially to our success. We've recently been uh, named by APTA, uh, the best uh, large North American uh, it's okay. uh, transit agency. We've had a couple of years of uh, climbing ridership and um, it's pretty exciting, but it makes it a little bit more difficult when you develop your strategy on converting the fleet. And the reason it makes it more difficult is because now you have to project your fleet growth at the same time as your replacement cycles. And most buses and most transit agencies have a replacement cycle of about 12 to 18 years. And most transit agencies generally try to purchase buses in larger orders. So you may be purchasing 300 buses, maybe delivering them over a year or two, and then maybe you take a little break and repeat the cycle again. So um, where we are right now is we have about 100 uh, straight diesel buses remaining in our fleet. We've only been purchasing diesel electric hybrid buses. That's been our strategy for years now. Um, we have 174 zero emission electric trolley buses, similar to the one Sarah mentioned that are applying the streets of Vancouver. And we have the 21 battery electric buses. The battery electric buses are in two different configurations. The first 11 buses have a smaller battery pack uh, they follow what's called a fast charging strategy or opportunity charging strategy. And we have charges for those buses at one of our park and ride transit centers. The 10 additional buses that we're adding, or we're in the process of adding right now, we're going to start the testing and their evaluation over a 12 to 18 month period, have larger battery packs and they are primarily overnight charging. We have two utilities that we source our energy from, uh, Seattle City Light and Puget Sound Energy. They've been great partners in this project. Um, actually, on my drive up here, we had a conference call with the Seattle City Light on discussing how we are going to move forward with converting the first uh, electric bus depot and what it's going to look like. We try to share our goals and align them, not just between agencies, but between operators. And we are looking at batteries as, uh, from battery electric buses 
as a piece of hardware that needs to be further developed. We need to find a secondary life for them. And we've been working with our utilities. They're very interested uh, in working with us in potentially, um, we would remove the batteries at end of life from our buses. Our utility, one of our utilities could take the batteries and use them for peak shaving and extract further value from them. Another potential use is they could, uh, as a secondary life would be the use on the trolley fleet. Our trolley buses have a smaller battery pack for off-wire operation in order to avoid construction sites or during um, street closures. The big challenge up ahead of us, by 2021, we, that's our target, we're working to design a 120 to 125 bus, electric bus depot or base. And um, a lot of the challenges are obvious, some of them are not so obvious. But again, with our partner utilities, with our partner cities that we operate and where the bases are based on, uh, we're on track, we're on schedule, and uh, we've selected not just this space, but the first uh, series of electric bus deployments to meet our environmental and social justice goals, which means we're going to try to operate these buses and locate them at uh, bases that are located in areas whose residents are most at risk. It's a very complicated endeavor. It requires partnerships with the bus manufacturers, the utilities, the residents, uh, the leadership of the 39 cities that we operate in. So it's, um, it's, quite, uh, it's quite exciting and uh, it's wonderful to be able to meet with these folks and share a story that outlines a different future, a different way of thinking about what this city could look like by 2040. Part of our design for the first bus depot, we're going to try to develop what we would call a blue book of standards and requirements. That's gonna become the blueprint for the modifications required to transition our six other existing bases. However, if you remember a little bit earlier, I mentioned about our increasing ridership. Our projection, projections show that we may also need to build two additional new bus garages. Our bar bus garages have capacity of 200 to 300 buses each. And uh, locating the new depots, it's going to be less difficult when we approach the municipalities and we propose to them that we're going to build a bus depot in your city that's going to house 100% electric buses. If those buses were diesel power or a different type of fuel source, the conversation would be a little bit more complicated and a little more difficult. So 13% of our fleet is zero emissions. We have 87% to go. <laughs> Thank you very much for taking the time out to stop by and to see us and to listen to our little presentations. Uh, these initial pilots are very important because more than anything, they're the beginning of a conversation. And the conversation is transit's future role in a sustainable city. How does a transit system look like 10, 20, 30, 40 years from now? So I really appreciate you taking the time out and joining us. And uh, hopefully you have some nice questions for us. Thank you. Hi, I'm Peter Ladner, as Alex so kindly noticed. Um, I'm the chair of the Better, Transporta Better Transit and Transportation Coalition in Metro Vancouver. My question is, um, as we anticipate changes with the arrival of, well, in arrival in our case and the impact in Seattle's case of ride hailing, ride sharing, shared electric, automated vehicles and all of that, are we gonna keep using transit the same way we are now? And do you just expect all these trend lines to continue or are you factoring that in? And in which, in which case, assuming all those vehicles are going to be or headed in the electric direction, to what extent will they contribute to you achieving these goals? So I'll, I'll start off. Great, thank you. Uh, very good question. And uh, it's a very interesting dilemma to have to figure out what is transportation gonna look like 10, 15, 20 years from now. Um, 
I'm sort of participating in a focus group that we're doing in uh, King County Metro right now that I find very fascinating. One of our park and ride facilities, if you're not there by about seven o'clock in the morning, you can't find a parking spot. And that's really a good dilemma to have because it's sort of, uh, we've become a victim of our own success. Four or five people will use one of our van pool vehicles instead of driving four or five personal cars to the park and ride. Mm -hmm. So it sort of becomes part of the extension of the transit system. Um, it maybe addresses a little bit of that first mile, last mile, and it's not a solution that works everywhere. But I think uh, if you're in the transit business for the next 10, 15, 20 years, you have to learn to be very flexible and innovative and open to suggestions and solutions. And you have to try things, even if some of them may work better than others. Hi, Peter. Um, I actually don't have too much more to add to that. Um, I was going to talk about the first mile, last mile. Um, we're in conversation with the um, government agencies, municipalities about what ride share is going to look like. Um, as, a, as an organization, I think w the, the thoughts are that it's going to be complementary. Um, so we will, we will have to work together. Um, there is a, a group uh, established at TransLink um, looking at mobility as a service and what the future of, of transit looks like. So um, I guess I, I don't really have much more to add. Thank you. The only thing I'll add to that, Peter, and I think it's a very important question. We're in a very dynamic space. Ride hailing is something that will happen likely within a year or so uh, here in British Columbia. And everywhere we've seen it introduced, there's been a bump in congestion and a bump in GHGs. Ride hailing can provide an important service, but we have to have a climate lens. We have to look at the implications of multiple uh, clients being um, being sh uh, being used in in ride hailing services. We have to look at the um, how do we incentivize low emission vehicles. We have to look about where there are potentially no go zones in really well served transit areas, and that needs to be part of the debate in British Columbia, which is an emerging leader, a re-emerging leader on the climate file, notably around zero emission vehicles. We have a question right here. Sure. I have a question for Danny. I'm Dom Repta from TransLink. Uh, we work a lot with uh, King County Metro. My question is on the trolley. Sarah mentioned our trolley's up for uh, retirement soon, so we have a big decision to make. Um, if you could just expand on your trolley situation, are they new? Um, our economics show clearly that battery buses from an economic perspective might be more favorable, but there's obviously more considerations. Um, so just maybe just um, let the folks know what, what you consider for the trolleys. Sure, thanks, another good question. Um, our trolleys are about four or five years old. They're in good condition. Um, one of the interesting thing is if you look at this uh, last slide is um, the trolley buses are a proven robust technology. They provide the benefit today. Actually, in Seattle, believe it or not, that 13% that of the fleet provides about 20% of the trips. And um, these are zero emission trips. And it's a lot easier to get somebody in one of my electric trolley buses than it is to get that somebody in a Chevy Bolt or in a Tesla through a government purchase incentive. I think that's a more difficult road. Um, I think that trolley buses, at a minimum, they're going to be complementary to battery electric buses. Um, each one can end up being optimized for a certain type of operation uh, based on uh, where things can, in terms of charging infrastructure, in terms of electric infrastructure, where you can or cannot deploy it. Um, but again, as you're moving towards that all-electric future, I think it's important to realize that that 13% of my fleet is basically no risk. In the 87% that I'm replacing, I will be introducing some risk as the technology emerges, develops, and eventually matures. So I can't expect today's battery electric bus to have the same reliability, availability uh, numbers as a mature diesel bus that's been under development for the last 75 years or so. So that's kind of like the, that's the lens that I'm looking at. Uh, I know it's a little more technical and it kind of leaves out the financial aspect. But I think the financial aspect will come a little bit later once people start to optimize the design of each one of the vehicles, whether it's a battery electric bus, electric trolley bus, or even a fuel cell bus. We have a question right here. Okay, then we'll go to Tom Green right here, David Suzuki Foundation. Yes, uh, thank you and thanks for the introduction there. 
Alex. And I, sorry, I was late. I was at the um, Generate 2018 conference put on by Clean Energy British Columbia. So it's very much about electrifying things. So exciting to have two events, competing events on the same day that are about this important topic. And Danny, I guess I'm wondering, what do you feel is the optimal size for the pilot of a battery electric bus? Because it feels like the scale that you have or that the city of Toronto has or Edmonton have for their pilots is much greater than TransLink. And I don't know if you both want to comment on, on that. Thanks. Yeah, I guess I'll start it off with um, the size of the pilot can be defined by a couple of different things. Uh, so one of the things that's important is when you were one of the... Uh, um, one of the early adopters of the technology, you're going to pay a premium for it. You're going to suffer some operational consequences. Uh, the learning uh, curve is very steep. But it gives you the opportunity to go and work with the manufacturers and provide feedback. And what you get out of it is you get the opportunity to optimize the system to your operation. If you're a late adopter, you're pretty much buying something off the shelf that's been optimized for somebody else. So um, what we're trying to learn with these pilots is, what is the right size battery? Does the bus have enough power? Can we, um, can we do the same type of work that a diesel bus can do? Or maybe the answer is not in every case. In cases where we can do the same type of work, do we look at different opportunities? And the one nice thing about electric buses is uh, being zero emissions you can actually park them indoors. And I've seen a pretty interesting uh, model. Uh, there's a technical university in Sweden that uh, has done a little model or a little mock-up where um, there's a coffee shop slash library, uh, two roll-up gates, bus rolls in, students can get on and off, and bus rolls out, out of the building. That's a pretty interesting model that you would never consider with a diesel or compressed natural gas bus. So again, um, you have to pick the size of your fleet based on how much you can afford to spend on it, uh, how much you can support. Obviously, if you, let's say, start off with a pilot fleet of 50 buses, you will need a lot of technical support in-house, as well as from the manufacturer. Uh, a larger fleet advances your learnings. A smaller fleet uh, maybe allows you to absorb the learnings at a more controlled pace. So there are pros and cons, but um, generally one or two buses, too small, maybe 10 buses or more of each type, starts giving you statistically significant data. Sir, we'll, have, we'll then go up here to the center and to the left hand side. Okay, so um, for our bu uh, electric bus pilot project, we're working with QTRIC, which is a Canadian Urban Transportation Innovation and Research Consortium. Um, so the idea of this pilot project is to test the interoperability between charging stations and bus manufacturers. Um, there have been um, situations where the buses and the charging stations are proprietary. So the idea is, this to, is to advance a standard to allow that interoperability. We're starting with four buses um, on Route 100. So we've got two new flyer buses and two Nova buses. Um, but we've just recently um, been awarded or um, provided funding for six additional buses. So we will be having 10 buses um, on that route. The charging stations can uh, accommodate ab about 11 to 12. So we would like to fully electrify Route 100 um, first. And a big consideration for us is the planning for the infrastructure. Um, that's significant. So this gives us that 10 bus start. Um, it's a good number for us to start working in terms of bus operator training, the maintenance team, and then we'll continue um, another pro pilot project. The next one that we would most likely look at is depot charging. Um, and that's something that we have to get our heads around, as well as our 60-foot articulated buses. Um, so those are in, are in the future. Okay. Right to the back. Yeah, thanks. Um, Chris Hatch with National Observer. I'm curious. You can you hear okay? Volume a little bit. Thanks. Okay. Um, I'm curious. I, I mean, I sort of feel like you, you both have laid it out as, you know, you've got the targets and trials are underway and it's all going to happen. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about where are the log jams? You know, where do you need more support? What would make it happen faster? What problems are you running into? Like, wh where are those log jams? Is my question really? Sure. Um, as I mentioned, the 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 major issues for Translink right now are funding 
um, so that that capital investment that's required. Um, and, and it's a conversion from our current operating cost to a capital cost. Um, so we're, we need support for, for those dollars, um, whether it's the green infrastructure fund, whether it's support from the Ministry of Energy and Mines in terms of carbon credits for electrification. We, we just need to, to find that funding support. Um, the other challenge, of course, is location of charging infrastructure. Um, there's some areas throughout the region that we own. Um, that's an easy option. Um, there's some that we lease, but there's some areas where we might need charging infrastructure where we don't have any relationship at all. Um, another one is the advancement of technology. So once the technology advances um, to the point where um, it makes sense for us to adopt the adopt and, and more of a full scale, um, that, that's where we'll transition. Our analysis shows that that's around 2023. Um, in the interim, we're looking at using renewable fuels so we can start moving to a, a lower greenhouse gas emission. Um, but then on the renewable fuels, funding support, policy direction, um, there, there's, a lot, there's a lot of government uh, support that we can have to, to make this transition. Do you have anything to add to that at all? No. Okay. Uh, one question on that. Is the question really a matter of capital? Because on a life cycle basis, um, you make savings yes. and it's just accessing that capital. It's the upfront capital. Yeah. I think it's a really important question, Chris, because I think that that 2050 target can, or, or horizon can probably move back to 2040 with an ambitious um, BC clean growth strategy. Um, we have a question um, right uh, here. Um, from Mashtaba Lejeverde, who is a renewable natural gas analyst. Uh, hello, I uh, just wondering if in uh, TransLink or in uh, Seattle authorities, is there any uh, consideration uh, to team up with the trucking industries or uh, trucking companies to uh, to basically reduce the cost of the infrastructure on a, on a trolley buses or mm -hmm. either. Um, uh, just these deep, deep pots. So we know that this uh, trucking battery electrics or uh, trolley buses, the example in the port of Los Angeles, uh, being used. So is there any consideration on that? Actually, we were just talking about this before um, over lunch. So for the charging infrastructure for um, our on, on route charging, we're expecting that a bus will encounter a charger every hour. Um, throughout the day. So the, the opportunity to share that charger is less likely throughout the day, but in the evenings um, and overnight, there is a possibility. So whether it's a tour bus operators, um, municipal fleet, I think there is that, that possibility. Um, trucking, we haven't yet explored um, in terms of, of sharing the infrastructure. At our depots, it would be more complicated because that is behind the fence and um, there's, there's more risk involved. I'll let Danny speak from, from King County. Thank you, Simon. Um, so the Society of Automotive Engineers in the United States, uh, under the auspices of EPRI, Electric Power Research Institute, uh, has uh, put together a bus and truck uh, set of meetings that takes place about three times a year. It takes place at the same time as uh, another work group is working on the overhead charging standards. Uh, that's what Sarah mentioned before. and. Uh, King County Metro, we're looking forward to the day when we can divorce the infrastructure from the vehicles. Currently, you purchase a bus and you purchase the infrastructure from the OEM that builds the bus. We don't believe that's a scalable model. And um, we are in conversations uh, with the package delivery folks. Um, we believe that uh, companies like FedEx, UPS, um, DHL will be the early adopters in the trucking industry in cities. They they. They have similar operations to ours. Uh, not a lot of miles, not a lot of hours, a lot of uh, time basically sitting around between deliveries and so plenty of opportunities to charge. So hopefully we can get to a place where the charging infrastructure standards will be adopted by all bus and trucking manufacturers. We can get that interoperability. We can possibly share the infrastructure in some places. So that's why this is really an exciting space to be in. Question back here. Thank you. My name is David Grigg. I'm a frequent transit user. Uh, no one has spoken yet about light rail, and the part that may play. Um, obviously, the capital cost in light rail is much higher than buying buses initially. 
I assume that, but please comment otherwise. But one thing that um, sticks out uh, in this building some five or six years ago, we had uh, a fellow by the name of Gerard Walker came from Australia, I think, and mentioned that the technology wasn't really important. What really counted was the frequency. And we have heard recently many times that the frequency of light rail supersedes that of buses. So I'm wondering where this sits in your thinking process in terms of lifetime capital cost. <laughs> yeah, I'll start it off. That's fine. <laughs> so I'm going to shift. I'm going to shift the answer a little bit to my lens. Um, as we're moving forward and we're looking at places to deploy charging stations and uh, stationary ba stationary batteries and that sort of stuff, uh, we are working with our light rail partners. Uh, we do have a light rail operation uh, in Seattle. It's operated by um, Sound, uh, Sound Transit. Uh, you can, if you do come to Seattle, please take that from the airport. Don't rent a car. It's it's easy to get into town. It's uh, it's, it's only three dollars. Um, we also have uh, two streetcar lines. There's some debate about opening a third one currently. It's pretty difficult when you're talking about uh, putting infrastructure in somebody's front yard. You know, and there's there's a lot of conversation, a lot of dialogue over that. Um, obviously, when you do have a dedicated right of way. And we see that uh, with light rail, but uh, in Seattle, we also have some uh, dedicated right of way for buses, same as in Vancouver. You can increase the frequency safely, and you can move more people per unit time. Uh, obviously, on rail, you can move a higher number of people than you could on buses, but uh, it's difficult to adjust to the frequencies. But without getting too much into the design stuff, I think that in the future, the transit network is going to be much more integrated than I think than you see it today in terms of, I think we're gonna have the software capabilities in place where you can actually synchronize the arrival of buses, light rail, trains, um, first mile, last mile options, um, Uber or whatever your preference is. And I think we're moving in that direction. I think you can kind of see that uh, progress being made and Hopefully, I got you a little bit, maybe closer to an answer. But I see you holding your face, so I'll I'll try to let Sarah. <laughs> I'll, I'll try to let Sarah fill, fill this up. Well, I, I think I'm going to put that back to you and, and ask you if 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 that satisfies your your question, or if you if you're looking well, for more information. Why wasn't it considered in the analysis? It didn't appear anywhere. Right, yeah, so uh, that is a good question. In fact, through the whole year of, of presenting the information from our low carbon fleet strategy, we haven't been asked that question. Um, uh, similar to what Danny was talking about, uh, priority lanes, um, connecting, in, truly integrated and connected uh, transit system. Um, that is the future, our B lines um, and, and the uh, rapid transit, but we haven't considered the cost comparison between moving to an electric fleet versus a light rail. Um, I, I don't think it's doable, but it is certainly something that I can take back and, uh, and see if we can do that analysis. And I, and I would be happy to get in touch with you. You're welcome. Yeah, I, I think it's a very important question, and I'll go back to the very first point around land use and the capital costs of light rail and SkyTrain or, or heavy, heavy transit rail are very, very expensive, 50 to $100 million a, um, a, a, a kilometer, and they're quite prohibitive unless you have people in those corridors. In Greater Vancouver, about 20% of the population is within a kilometer of some kind of rapid transit. Um, you go to a place like Barcelona, and it's 60% of your population. We have a 20% transit mode share. Um, Barcelona has a 40% transit mode share in terms of the, the primary mode. It's simply about getting growth in the corridors. We have transit stations that are 15 to 30 years old and they still are surrounded by single family homes. And those stations cost in the order of $50 million. We have to look, the lowest cost investment in transit in this region is a zero cost investment and it's by putting more jobs and more people, more residents in those underutilized transit stations. And, and that's something that we have to consider if we want to reduce congestion and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And we need to complement it by uh, a heavy electric and then a renewable fuel uh, agenda. Jeremy um, from Clean Energy Canada. 
Awesome. Thanks. Um, we do a lot of work on provincial and federal policy. So I'm going to ask a kind of policy question. Um, uh, looking historically and then into the future, what uh, what sort of policies have worked, you know, in partnership with the provincial government and federal government? And what are you looking for going forward? You know, this is picking up on Chris's question a little bit. I'll seed it a bit for some of the things that I'm interested in, the low carbon fuel standard in British mm -hmm. Columbia, you know, links to this carbon pricing. And then there's also, you know, the funding models, which you had brought forward. Um, same question to you, maybe more familiar than I need to be with the U.S. federal government at this point, but uh, uh, also curious on the state level. I'm not as familiar at, uh, on that side. Great, great question. Sure. Um, so the, the policy that comes to mind and the, the program that's been most useful um, with the low carbon fleet strategy is our low carbon fuel program under the Ministry of Energy and Mines. Um, so um, being the considered a fuel supplier for our compressed natural gas, we gain carbon credits. Um, so we can then invest those carbon credits back into clean transportation. That has been um, proven to be very useful, um, of course, um, being able to expand our, our lower carbon fleet, recognizing that compressed natural gas isn't, isn't 100% renewable. In the future, um, consideration about ownership of um, RNG credits has, has been a point of discussion. Um, when we move to RNG, we will be um, considered the fuel supplier like CNG. And of course, that, that gives more benefit. It's um, more expensive to buy RNG than it is CNG. Um, looking at uh, ownership of electricity credits, um, when we transition to um, an electric bus fleet, we are in conversation with BC Hydro about ownership of those credits. Um, and policy direction again on availability um, of other renewable fuels such as renewable diesel, um, policy direction on um, availability of electric vehicles to support our non-revenue fleet and our, and our community um, shuttles and our handy dart vehicles, as well as um, policy support on or, or some support from government on charging infrastructure. And again, that would come from funding. Looking forward. If you really brief question, response, and then we're going to go to our last two questions. Well, let's let's take more time. Okay. I think Sarah pretty covered it. OK, great. We have two questions uh, right back to back, and then we'll have those answers. Sure. Um, my name is Massa. I'm an intern architect at Dialogue. Um, I was really surprised, pleasantly surprised, to hear that in last October, we they had the highest usership of, mm -hmm. or ridership. Um, but you didn't, is there any specifics on um, where the ridership was? Like for instance, was it in the trains or the buses? Um, and then my question kind of tail ends, uh, this gentleman on the other side of the rooms, um, your answers were that it was the immediate economic um, factor that you guys are leaning more towards the bus routes. But I was mostly disappointed by um, only replacing renewable uh, diesel for the for the uh, West Coast Express, and why it hasn't been um, studied to extend the production line over to that side of the city, and if you guys have also considered, um, <laughs> yeah, big questions, um, if you've considered harnessing other sources um, to produce your electricity, for instance, um, photovoltaic panels in the infrastructure. There's three big questions that I hear in there, and we'll go to Andy. Um, okay. was, just take the microphone there, Andy. This is for our online audience. My quick question was, um, what is the capital uh, cost of a new electric bus versus a diesel bus, mm -hmm. and how long is the lifetime? Because they're rolling all the time. So it speaks to your technology assessment sort of commentary. Electric buses, I presume, like electric cars, have a lot less moving parts in them. So their reliability is way higher. How quickly, if you really got aggressive, could you turn the fleet over with every time a diesel bus approached, you know, I'm getting pretty tired here, drop it early rather than late mm. and switch. How quickly could you turn the fleet over? I have no idea. Is it a 5, 10, 15 year turnover? I'd be interested. Okay. okay. Oh. Do you handle any please. Okay. questions? So, um, so we, have to, we have a fleet turnover. Yeah. We have a question about renewable feedstocks, okay. diversification. Um, where West Coast is Express. our ridership growing? Okay. 
Okay, so I'll start with the ridership question. So we saw an increase in ridership in all modes. Um, so um, it, I think we saw the highest uh, ridership increase in our buses in that month. And then we saw, of course, an increase in our SkyTrain West Coast Express. Um, so that's a good news story. In terms of our West Coast Express, we haven't yet done that analysis yet. Um, when I said that I would assume that we would transition to renewable diesel, um, that would be the easiest solution um, for West Coast Express. So that is to, to be determined um, and part of our future studies. Um, and then you had a third question as well. Yes, yes. So um, we're looking at uh, renewable energy options for our facilities. Um, we have discussed the idea of renewable energy, whether it's solar or energy storage at the charging infrastructures themselves. Um, but because of the rate structure here in British Columbia and the lower cost of electricity, uh, we don't need to consider that right now. It's just not worth the, the investment, the, the capital investment at this time. Future perhaps, but, but at this time it's, it's not where we're focusing. And then switching to the fleet re replacement. So we replace our um, buses generally on a 17 year cycle. Um, the states is 12 years and that's due to federal funding. Um, so so that, that motivates that, that earlier um, transition. Um, we're looking at that, that life cycle. We're not sure where that sweet spot is, but, but today we replace them on a 17-year 17 17 year, um, cycle. The cost of um, current diesel buses, I'm, if I'm not mistaken, is around $650,000. Um, battery buses are around $800,000. Um, yes, yeah, but we get significant fuel savings with battery electric buses. Um, so once we start replacing our buses, then, then that's where um, the full life cycle costs, we've looked at our maintenance class, we've looked at a battery replacement midlife for electric buses. So all of it combined, our full life cycle costs, it's about the 2023 mark where we see battery electric buses on par with diesel. Um, we've already made our um, investments in our charging infrastructure for our diesel and our CNG um, fleet. So we've taken that into consideration. Hey, Andy, we will take one question from you and have a quick. Your lifetime of 17 years, is that like a midlife engine upgrade as well in some way? Yes, it includes a, includes a midlife overhaul. Okay, so for the online audience, uh, the question was, does the life cycle in analysis include a midlife, a midlife uh, analysis and the overhaul, and it, and it does. Um, thank you very much for great questions once again. We're so lucky to have such a, an inquisitive and smart audience. I really got to say again and again, we did a little bit of analysis and this is Im important because what um, uh, is being done by King County and what is being done uh, by TransLink is something that we can learn from and we can inform what's happening across British Columbia, across Canada and across the United States. And looking at some of the analysis from both of these organizations, we looked at what could happen to the to the uh, bus fleet in British Columbia if we tr we if we accelerated um, the horizon towards 2040 in British Columbia, and it would be a very different profile of buses in the transit and the school bus. School buses we have way more, but they have much lower uh, kilometers. Uh, but we we saw that you could actually make about a 250 thousand ton reduction by 2030. We have hard 2030 targets. It does involve the provincial government um, matching their laudable, laudable effort on zero emission personal vehicles with extra effort on, uh, on buses, both transit um, and school buses and commercial buses. Um, so this is, a, this is a scenario that we blogged about and you can find it online. We did similar analysis that we'll soon um, uh, blog about for, uh, um, uh, for Canada as a whole, but we're looking at being able to reduce, pretty much decimate 35 megatons of GHGs um, by, by 2030, our, our Paris horizon. And then the United States, that's 350 megatons of GHGs across the United States. These organizations are really showing us where we're able to go. And it's something that we need to be able to rapidly learn and deploy this learning across different types of fleet operators. Um, Renewable Cities is having a conference that will coincide with the largest economies in the world coming to Vancouver, their energy um, uh, delegations from their energy ministers, and local governments are really providing a pathway 
um, and local authorities like transit authorities providing a huge amount of direction that we need to better align with senior governments. Our whole conference in May of next year is gonna be looking at how local authorities better collaborate with senior governments to stick handle many of these important challenges around renewable natural gas, around personal emission, uh, personal vehicles, transit fleets, uh, but also around integrated land use and transportation planning. So if any of you are interested in that, um, we would love to have you here in Vancouver, those of you around the table and also online. This uh, streaming video will be available in about a week's time on our YouTube channel. I really want to thank Sitka Foundation, North Growth Foundation, and Simon Fraser University and the MJ Wass Center for Dialogue. Without them, uh, events like this wouldn't, be, wouldn't happen. We'll see you in the new year. Thank you very much. Thank you.